This is the story of American freedom. The frontier. It was the frontier that took the Old Testament, Greece and Rome, the ideals of Christianity, the English tradition of freedom, and fused them into a unique American ideal of freedom. The frontier, it has always been about unlimited opportunity. The unlimited opportunity for land, a continent that spread ever before you, Unlimited opportunity to exploit natural resources. Unlimited opportunity to go as far as you could. It was to be able to build your cabin where you didn't have to see the smoke from a neighbor's cabin. It was the very antithesis of crowded, dirty cities. It was freedom. Freedom to tell ah, your uh, owner of your tenant farm in Pennsylvania. I don't have to stay here and farm for you. I'm going to go out to Indiana and be a judge. And that today is what we're really concerned with. That's what many Americans feel passing away from them. This sense of unlimited opportunity. This sense to be anything you want. This sense that you're stuck in an economy, in a set of jobs where you and your wife must work and you're never really going to get ahead. Most Americans can't put their fingers on it, but that's what it is. The disappearance of the idea of unlimited opportunity, which made America unique. The frontier. In 1775 and 1776, the time of Lexington and the Declaration of Independence, Daniel Boone led a group of settlers through the Cumberland Gap into what would become Kentucky. That was every bit as an important event as, a, as an event. They named one of their little fortified settlements, plunged deep in the heart of Indian territory, deep in the long disputed hunting ground of the Cherokee and Shawnees. They named it Lexington after that battle they had heard had been fought, away, had been fought far away in Massachusetts. The frontier, the opportunity to advance as far as possible. And it was amazing how rapidly these land-hungry Americans spread across filling up the reaches all the way to the Mississippi River. How rapidly states like Mississippi and Alabama and Indiana and Ohio came into the Union. The frontiersman, always the leading proponent of democratic freedom. The frontiersman, he hated nothing more than big banks and big government. In fact, his definition was stay off of my property and leave my gun alone. That's what he saw as his freedom. No one epitomized this more than Andrew Jackson. He may truly be called the last of the founders. For he fought in the Revolutionary War as a lad of 14. Lost a brother in the Revolutionary War due to British cruelty refused to blacken the boots of a British officer who slashed him with a saber, leaving him a scar which he proudly bore his whole life long. Andrew Jackson, warrior and general, self-made man, leader of them, the American forces, the militia, as they marched down upon the Creek Indians gaining his first great notoriety with his victories at Talladega. Uh, he had three great hatreds, and these were hatreds shared by the frontiersmen. We don't share them. We recognize them as being wrong, but we must understand them. 
He hated the Indians. He claimed to have a certain regard for them. They had surely had a regard for him. He was called Sharp Knife. He was the one who, as Davy Crockett, ordered them to shoot them down like dogs at the Battle of Talladega. Burn their villages. Davy Crockett tells us how, yeah, we were so hungry at the end of that fight. We went into the village and rooted around for something to find, to eat. And we found some sweet potatoes. But unfortunately, they were in a hut where a number of Indians had been burned. And there was Indian grease all over them from their bodies. But we ate them. Now today, when somebody passes the potatoes, I generally say, give them on to somebody else. Sharp Knife who told the Cherokees, brothers, go across the great water. You will not keep your lands. You will not keep your way of life here. I tell you this in your own best interest. And he hated the Spaniards, the Dons as he called them. And nothing pleased him more than when after the successful conclusion of a uh, First Seminole War, he was able to seize uh, the Floridas from Spain. Of course, he was chastised by Congress. They could never fully understand this bold man of freedom. But it was ratified. Spain was, Florida was purchased from the Spaniards. But most of all, there were the English. But oh, how he hated the English. And one of his greatest achievements as one of our greatest generals came when on January the 8th, 1815, he defeated the English forces at the Battle of New Orleans. A far better equipped, a far larger English force. And leading the British to put into their officer's field manual, British officers are strongly recommended not to attempt to attack a frontal position fortified and held by American frontiersmen. Oh, people try to push that aside. How important was that? The Treaty of Peace had already been signed. It was very important. Britain did not recognize our claim to the Louisiana Purchase. So Thomas, uh, Thomas, uh, so Andrew Jackson represents this frontiersman writ large. But equally well, frontiersman was Thomas Jefferson, born in the Blue Ridge Mountains, imbued with that same spirit of democratic freedom that Jackson had, that this was to be a country for ordinary Americans, and that every American ought to be provided with the opportunity to have land of his own. Jefferson may very well rank as the greatest of Americans. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. Would that be, not be enough for any one man? But as president, he also purchased Louisiana doubled our nation's size, the greatest real estate deal in history. He had sworn eternal hatred against all forms of tyranny. He believed that the tree of liberty needed to be watered from now and from every once in a while by the blood of tyrants. But in 1802, in the spring, he, he had a problem as president, uh, and that problem was New Orleans. Now, New Orleans was not part of the United States. That whole southern area was not part of the settlement with Britain, and it had belonged to Spain. Spain had been taking it from France at the, the end of the War of 1763. But now Jefferson was receiving disturbing news that Spain, its king, had transferred control 
over New Orleans and the whole of the Louisiana Territory to France, to the France of Napoleon, eager and expansionistic and warlike. And the problem was serious. Now, if you were a farmer in Ohio or Indiana or Tennessee or Kentucky and you grew your crop, you know you had to do something with that crop. You just didn't eat the corn. You had to have hard cash to pay your taxes, to buy more land. And the only way you could get that hard cash was to turn your produce from your farm into something useful. One of the most useful of all items was good corn whiskey. You didn't want the corn to sit around and rot, you transformed it into whiskey, and that was a staple of currency on the frontier. You could also slaughter your pigs and turn them into salt pork. But now how were you going to get them to market? Were you going to put them on Interstate 40 and drive them to the East Coast? Huh? Were you going to load them up on an airplane in Nashville and fly them? No. And there were almost no roads worthy of the name in the entire United States. The only way to get them to market was to float them down various rivers like the Tennessee into the Mississippi and all the way down to New Orleans where they would be offloaded, put on other ships, sent around Florida and up the East Coast. The trouble was the Spaniards were very difficult to deal with. They did not like this new republic. Thus, you might get your, uh, your corn whiskey and your salt pork all the way down the Mississippi River, get to New Orleans and be told, I'm sorry, we're not allowing American ships to offload. There you were, stuck. So disgruntled were the frontiersmen out in the West that they were talking seriously with emissaries from the Spanish government about breaking off and joining the Spanish Empire. Thus Jefferson had to find a way to buy New Orleans. He sent off as an emissary, ultimately James Monroe, with an offer of $2 million to Napoleon to sell New Orleans. Well, Napoleon was, no, wasn't interested in selling New Orleans. No, no, wouldn't even really see James Monroe. Then suddenly one day, he called James Monroe into his august presence and said, I will not sell you New Orleans, but I will sell you the whole of Louisiana. What? Yes, and for $15 million. $15 million? Yes, a few cents a square mile probably. 850,000 square miles. I don't know. I, I don't have any permission to, to make such a deal. You better, you better think fast. Make your decision. I've got two other buyers ready to go. The real estate agent, Napoleon. What was Jefferson to do? He believed in a strict construction of the Constitution, didn't he? He didn't see any provision there for him to uh, buy this land. But he was convinced by his advisors that, uh, well, he had the right to make treaties, and maybe this was a treaty. Now, he knew that his bitter opponents, the Federalists, the believers in a big government, high taxes, uh, would be absolutely opposed to this. They would say what this country most needs is cash money. What it does not need is more land. This is crazy. But Jefferson went around to him, men from Boston and elsewhere, and said, now, who gives you the biggest campaign contributions? Do they not come from the people who make coats and hats? Yes. Uh, those coats and hats, what are they made out of? Beavers? How have prices been lately? Prices have skyrocketed. The poor little creatures have been driven to extinction. Ah. 
But if we were to buy this territory, there would be millions and millions of those little flat-tailed creatures for you to buy the skins of. All right, done. Thus, Louisiana was purchased. But what do you do? First, you had to find out where it was. Called in the French ambassador and said, where is Louisiana? Well, we don't know. That's why we sold it to you. We don't know anything about it. Well, don't you have some idea? Well, we have this treaty with Spain. Uh, here's a map. What are all those look like camels and leopards out there? Ah, uh, yeah, we don't know what's out there, but we thought camels and leopards looked good on the map. I see. Um, any kind of definition? Well, as we generally have thought of it, it is the area drained by this river here called the Missouri. Yes. And where does the Missouri go? We don't know. Somewhere up that way. Uh, into the big mountains? Maybe. We don't know. We can't tell you. We've had fur traders go up the Mississippi far, but none really penetrate the Missouri. I see. And down here, does it go to the uh, Rio Grande? I don't think so, Mr. President. Maybe this river they call the Red, that might be it. Okay. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to send somebody out to explore it. And you go right down the hall and you get your protege, Meriwether Lewis. Not yet 30. Young Lewis, I've got an interesting proposal for you. Yes, where would you like, how would you like to go to where no white man has ever been before? I'll do it. Ah, the spirit of adventure. The quest. That was part of the frontiersman, too, to go over that next mountain to where nobody had ever been before. All right, I'm going to give you about six months to get trained. These are the things you're going to have to learn how to do. Draw maps. Take latitude and longitude. We've got to have absolutely accurate maps of every step of the way. You've got to bring me back a complete report on all the animals and plants out there. In fact, I want examples of every animal and plant. There are a number of Indian tribes out there. We've got to somehow tell them they are part of America now. Nobody's asked them about this, I guess, but they're part of America now. And, and you've got to keep a journal, day-by-day -day journal. Now, this can't be too big of a budget. No, sir. Uh, so a small corps of soldiers have to go with you. Yes, sir. Uh, You'll have to take care of them. I don't think there's a budget for a doctor. So you've got to learn surgery before you go. Yes, sir. All right. Now I'm going to teach you latitude and longitude. And so I took him out on the yard there at Monticello and taught him about latitude and longitude. Then sent him off to Philadelphia to his friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush, the most distinguished physician of the day. And Dr. Rush gave him a crash course in medicine, how to set a broken arm, for example, broken leg, uh, remove an arrowhead, and then said, if everything else fails, give them one of my patent medicines, these big mercury pills. That'll just blast anything out of them. And so today, we recognize sites where Lewis and Clark camped by massive amounts of mercury there in the soil. You've got to get a man to help you. And Lewis had his, in his mind, his best friend, William Clark, they would be friends their whole lives long. And he asked Clark, regular officer serving in the army, will you go with him? And Clark said, I'll go with you anywhere. And so Lewis and Clark, their names became entwined in history. They picked a corps of 40 men, ultimately 33 would make the whole journey with them. A Couple of interpreters, but mainly rough, tough frontiersmen from the frontier post of the United States Army, the core of discovery. And in May of the 22nd, 
1804, they started out from St. Louis on that great voyage. Now, they were poling up the Missouri River. Did they have a motor to attach? No. They were going against the current of the Missouri. That is to say, they had to push with their poles. Push, go back, push again. All day long. At some points where the current was swift, four miles was a good distance to make in a day. Clark, Clark stayed on board. He did most of the maps. Lewis liked to walk. And he would walk along with his rifle, shooting food for them. Every night they'd stop. They'd eat upwards of 8,000 calories. No, don't tell them they need a Caesar salad with croutons. They ate bear meat, venison, elk, buffalo. And as a prize, got a big drink of whiskey. That was what they cherished most dearly. And so they made their way all the way across Missouri. On July the 4th, for the first time, the 4th of July was celebrated there along the Missouri. They fired off their rifles and got three drinks for the evening. Then on up the river, meeting with the Indians like the Oto, on up to Council Bluffs in Nebraska, then across South Dakota, winter began to close in on them. And they chose for the winter court, their winter quarters, a camp of the Mandan Indians, a town of the Mandan Indians, a little north of Bismarck, North Dakota today. Fort Mandan, they named it. The Mandans had a remarkable civilization. Their houses were kept at a uniform temperature of 60 degrees. And all through that winter, the best relations were maintained between Lewis, Clark, their men, and the Mandans, particularly the Mandan ladies. There they celebrated Christmas, and as soon as the spring began to dawn, they set out again up the Missouri. They had with them an addition now, Charbonneau, seedy looking man, French fur trader, but he came to them with his pregnant wife in the middle of the winter and said, they tell me you're going into the land of the big mountains. They tell me you're even going to the big ocean. You'll never make it. Have you been out there? No. But I know this, you will not get through the big mountains. You will not get through the big snows without horses. To get those, you will need the help of the Shoshone Indians. Yes? My wife, she is Shoshone. What? She was captured as a girl and brought here to the Mandans. This is her, Sacagawea. She's pregnant. How is she, 14? You want to go? Charbonneau can take you. He wants double wages. So they set off across North Dakota, Montana, scaling the Great Falls, and then as twilight fell on an autumn evening, 1805, Clark wrote in his journal, ocean in view, oh great joy. And they had arrived at the Pacific Ocean, traveling 4,142 miles through the circuitous route of the rivers. And there they built Fort Clatsop, spent a rainy winter, and then looked and saw they had to go all the way back. President Jefferson had thought, said he might have a ship there for them, but he didn't. So they made their way back. All this time, the man keeping the most complete discipline. Just a word from Lewis and Clark, from the captains, was enough to get them to undertake any task no matter how arduous. This time, trying to explore more territory, 
Clark went down the Yellowstone, and there, not far from Billings, Montana, you see the one remaining trace, the word name William Clark carved on the yellow cliffs. Lewis followed the routes that went more north, hoping that the Missouri drained all the way into Canada, but it did not. And then joining up again, stopping briefly at Fort Mandan, and then heading on down as fall of 1806 began to dawn. As they were going downstream, down the Missouri, they met a boat going upstream with frontiersmen. They shouted to each other, pulled ashore, and these frontiersmen said, who are you? We're the Corps of Discovery. Everybody says you're dead. No, we only lost one man. He died of an appendicitis. What? Yeah. Wow. And so they went on in. And by September 22nd, the word had arrived in St. Louis, and the whole of the little town turned out to cheer them. This great voyage had been made the most successful single government enterprise in history. Coming in under budget, the loss of only one man, only one Native American killed in a knife fight over a rifle. Establishing diplomatic relations with 22 Native American tribes. Catalog, catalog, cataloging the plants, the animals, bringing back specimens, and superb maps of this territory. Even anthropological details about the Native Americans and dispelling forever the idea of a Northwest Passage out to the Pacific Ocean. They were celebrated when they got back to Washington. Lewis was sent out to be governor of Missouri. His good friend Clark came as his agent of Indian Affairs. But Lewis was truly a man of destiny. He was meant for one thing, and that was this great journey. Everything that he did up until then was meaningless. As he wrote on his 30th birthday, there in the Rockies, I am 30 years old, and what good have I done for the world? And everything he did after this mighty voyage was despair and disappointment. He could not find a girl to marry him. He was an utter failure as an administrator and governor. He never brought out a page of the journal that had been kept so carefully. Finally, attacked by bureaucrats, he made his way back to Washington to try to clear his name, and there, under mysterious circumstances, in October of 1809, he died in a small cabin. He had become a heavy drinker. Perhaps he committed suicide there in the wilderness. His friend Clark was far more level-headed, stayed on his head of Indian affairs, Ran for governor the first, when Missouri was admitted as a state. Lost. Went right on back to being head of Indian affairs. So good was he that the Indians called St. Louis the town of the red-haired man. He named his firstborn son Meriwether Lewis. And at the end of the, his life, his daughter tells us, he became obsessed with the idea that Lewis had been murdered and he could have saved his best friend. But that's the true spirit of the frontier, the two, true quest for adventure. Now, I know we can't capture that quest for adventure anymore. My classes have difficulty understanding this desire to go 
where no one has been before. But I decided to test this taste for adventure. Several years ago, my son and I, he was about 15 at the time, we had an RV, a huge RV, one of those giant motorhomes. And we went off on the trail all the way from St. Louis out to Oregon and back. The terrors of the road driving one of those things have nothing to compare with the Blackfeet Indians or the Savage Sioux. Oh, truckers, they're the black feet of the day. They try to drive you off the road. Drive through the traffic of Portland, Oregon, at 5 o'clock. And suddenly there's road construction, which in a nice little uh, accord would be nothing. But in this huge vehicle is death a thousand times over. There are always historical markers. Lewis and Clark marker this way. Then it comes a, a mountain and a sign that says, not suited for trucks or RVs. The boy is shouting, Dad, we can't go there. But would that have stopped Lewis and Clark? Well, as our two wheels dangled over the side of the cliff, perhaps, perhaps it would have, but we made our way on through. Oh, once I remember starting out from Theodore Roosevelt National Park, where we had camped. And I said, where are you? Listen, I told you not to go back there and go to sleep. Where are you? I need your help with this map. No words. Where are you? It's kind of a vague on top. And some people gesticulating wildly. There he was up on the roof. How was I to know? are the sewage dump. Now, Lewis and Clark did not have to worry about that, but some people are very particular, you know. And that was my son's task, was to dump the sewage. He's not very careful in those matters. And so they won't just let you dump them anywhere. They just have this little tiny tube. So I just let him do it and didn't think much about it. And suddenly there was beating on our door that night. And this group of outraged, again, could have been Indians, saying, what have you done? We've done nothing. Yes, you have. You've dumped your sewage all over. No, we haven't. They forced us to go back. Oh, that's just water. They sniffed. That's not water. So we had to flee to our van and flee out in the dark of night, pursued by these angry people who seemed to bring cars and motorcycles along with them. By the time we were high up in the mountains, and it was a Sunday, and the boy said, Dad, there's a, some cars behind us. I said, I don't care. I mean, Dad, like there are really some cars behind us. Well, I looked back, and miles going down were these cars. Bikers began to cut in front of me. On one side, the mountains. On the other side, a sheer cliff and a plunging mountains river. I had more obscene gestures made it to me on that day than the whole rest of my life put together. But then there was ocean in view. Oh, great glory. And then the trip back and a bonding experience that could never be repeated. I say to each of you, if you want to do one thing with your family, Get an RV, follow in the footsteps of Lewis and Clark, take their journals with you, and rediscover that quest for adventure. The Story of Freedom in America with Dr. J. Rufus Fears is made possible by the generous support of our freedom and heritage sponsors. The Story of Freedom in America is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma in partnership with the Alumni Association of the University of Oklahoma. 
For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.